Well, this is a nice change of pace because for the last eight weeks, we've only been thinking about the rings of power. Uh, and if you know me and if you know Michael and if you know Dan, we weren't exactly enamored of that show. So uh, I'm not generally a negative guy, but the negativity <laughs> that tended to pull me, pull that into me a lot more than I usually do. And so I am here with uh, Steve Babb, who is from the band The Glass Hammer, uh, along with now he's a published author. And I'm sure there are other attributes of him that I don't know that are positive, but we'll get into those. But what's great about this is two things. One, uh, we're two older guys who read Tolkien before the films came out. So everything is uh, uh, based on that rather than what we saw. And two, we actually met originally uh, over 22 years ago uh, because Steve is a part of a band called Glass Hammer, which uh, I guess if it, prog rock I, I, is that essentially a progressive rock band. Yeah, modern yeah. progressive rock band. Okay, so 22 years ago, I had the fortune of meeting Steve at a, a conference, a con right called Dragon Con, which is still going on. In 2000, this was gosh, this was just a year after we launched the site, and it was that year that uh, Glass Hammer, Steve's band came out with something called the Middle Earth album. Uh, and the Middle Earth album is an album, I think I, I'd say the first half is sort of like if if you were a band in Brie or at the Prancing Pony yeah. in Brie, right? That yeah, was the way right, that, right, yeah. And the last half is kind of songs that were still inspired by Tolkien, but not necessarily in... in no, 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 there was, there's actual, you know, modern music, I would guess, for, for 2020. Yeah, yeah, and when we can see it, right here, the Middle Earth album. It was a really fun album for me when it came out because it was somebody who was in the same way that you could say that um, J.D. Payne and Patrick McKay were playing in Tolkien's world. You were doing the same thing with perhaps a higher level of uh, engagement in well, Tolkien's world. There were some complaints because I think there's like a harpsichord. You know, the, the purists <laughs> were after me too, but this was more... You know, and it was quite a detour for the band because we were trying to establish ourselves as a, a you know, a progressive rock act. And yeah. and, so, and, and this is how many years after you started the band? So 93 was the first album. This is okay. coming up on our 30th anniversary. Uh, and we, this first few years, we were just trying to feel our way, trying to figure out what we were. The whole movement of progressive rock, it was a revival. Mm -hmm. uh, it was inadvertently started by Glass Hammer and I would say maybe six or seven other groups and some magazines and that sort of thing that were starting to pop up. And uh, so it's a lot with that audience uh, to really impress them. And uh, But we were kind of first out there, I guess, in the 90s. And so we just kind of really gotten our, found our niche and we had an album called Chronometry. Uh, and I guess it also came out in 2000, but it just kind of really put us on the map. Uh, kind of really bombastic stuff like uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. You know, it's always a throwback to some sort of sound from the 70s, really. Uh, so we just had established that, and then I guess uh, it was announced that there would be movies, that Peter Jackson movies were out, and that whole Tolkien thing came up in me again, and I just took us right off the side of the road <laughs> and, <laughs> and took us uh, but, over and Bree. I think we had more fun. I mean, we were laughing all the way through that album because of, uh, Fred Schindel and I did the voices. Mm -hmm. uh, we wrote the songs together. And, uh, we were, you know, trying to be hobbits and dwarves and just make a mess of it. And it's, it, you know, it became a hit with a certain uh, group. You know, I don't know that everybody particularly loved it. And, and of course, the prog rock audience has only figured out a few years later that, oh, this is... It's okay. It's Black Hammer. <laughs> they're going to do weird stuff now and then. Right. They, after uh, the films, they were like, oh, I see why you like uh, Tolkien. Uh, yeah, That's, it's a, yeah. There's a good reason. And um, I, I mean, I liked it because nothing like that had ever really been done before. Right. Yeah. No, it's fun. I, I love to be the first of something. And you want to kind of, you could put headphones on or sit in the dark, I guess, and just kind mm -hmm. of close your eyes. And, mm -hmm. and you're in kind of what my view of what a crazy night in uh, Bree might sound yeah. like. Yeah, it was it was so much fun, and um, I think I think the review that I gave it a quote from it is still on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can get it on I think Apple Music. You can download it. I don't think it's streaming, which we can get into later. Yeah, but yeah. 
<laughs> I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah but, but we, I, we still I, sell it. Yeah, we still I, sell it as a download. Yeah, as uh, a download. Yeah with, yeah, with the first Tolkien album we did. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's on our website. Like, yeah. So, well, we can jump into some more of that too because I know one, you've re- released a new album. Um, yes, we did. And then two, you've also published a book. Yes, which I did. we're going to talk about. But before before we we jump into that, um, seeing as somebody you're you know you're somebody who has done a lot of creative work in Tolkien's world. The first the first album was Journey of the Dunedain. It was all about the journey of the Dunedain, the Aragorn, right? And it, it, even the song titles are are exactly reminiscent of that. It's not like you're trying to beat around the bush there. Um, but we had Rings of Power, and we can't get away from it still because it's only it's only been a couple of weeks. No. And yeah. and like I said, I, I'm earlier, like I said before I think we started, I'm I'm generally not a, a negative guy, but man, that 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 show because it was so not Tolkien in so many ways, and it was done in my opinion like the writing was so poor. Some of the writing was just so ham fisted and clunky. It, it was awful. because rocks look down and a ship looks up. I think that was the one thing we all learned from the very first episode. <laughs> So, but what did, what did, what did you think as a, as somebody who's, you know, spent a lot of time in Tolkien's world and probably knows more than the showrunners about Tolkien then? Well, I think the marketing campaign, you know, set the tone in a, in a very bad way, very poor. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. You know, it's very poorly done. Uh, but I mean, they got lots of press. I don't know how much of it they bought and paid for, but. I, um, and then. Uh, you know, I was prepared to dislike it for a whole number of reasons that really weren't valid. Uh, when the first episode aired, it just became a lot of other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the writing was first and foremost, uh, and I was amazed uh, at how unlikable the characters were. And I couldn't believe yeah. that, that you know, and everybody's talked about, well, with that sort of budget, you know, how could something like that happen? And then there's this sort of circle of the wagons mentality with this group that loves to just defend them, you know, and, and just loves it. And to me, that makes it even more cringy. So you just kind of go into each episode prepared to hate it and talk about it the next day and tear it apart. And I, you know, I enjoyed watching video reviews of each show and, and that sort of thing. So it just, it just, for me, it just stank. And I, yeah, I think a large part of it is to do with just not understanding. Well, on the basic, most basic of level levels, not understanding how to write a story uh, and what key components of a story are. That's just baffling to me. I can understand, like, well, we just took Tolkien's name and we just threw all this stuff out there. Uh, I can understand that sort of mentality, but to have that wonderful opportunity. Uh, mm-hmm. and then and then waste it it just seemed like an incredible wasted opportunity uh, so that made it really sad in a big way yeah it's it's sort of like a, a lot of the criticism is that they didn't have the silmarillion they only had the appendices they only have the books and the appendices and that's all they could go on but the the opposite side of that coin is well you had the books and the appendices and you were still able to get so much of it wrong so yeah. that yeah. galadriel not the same galadriel her motivations are not the same at all even to the point of like in the last episode and, and the, like uh, you mentioned earlier that the last episode when we were talking earlier right. that the last episode does a lot it brings a lot of the things together yeah I which thought so. it feels like they had the last episode planned out they knew it was going to happen and then they had to throw in the seven other episodes the incredibly slow boring ones they had to have maybe maybe yeah. Yeah. Too many yeah. Um, yeah. yeah yeah but when they they couldn't even get the rings right for the rings of power they couldn't get the nine rings for for mortal men and the uh, the seven for the dwarf lords they didn't those are supposed to be made before the three elven rings yeah, yeah. and uh, it just i'm like that still like uh, you know i'm a purist at heart and when they when they can't get the basic thing right i just turn my hair out yeah and it could um, have been done there, there really was no need yeah. to re- rewrite it um, yeah they could have taken any facet of that time frame and, and yeah. elaborated on it. And I would have been happy to just view Middle Earth and sure right. make up some stories. But if you're gonna sure. if you're gonna mess with the you know the main items like rings and, and elves and you know, you yeah, kinda, you can't you, you, know, it's, you it's, can't do that. Yeah. So 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 when you write music like your first album, Journey of the Dunedain, and Middle Earth album, 
do you feel any sort of, I don't know, greater responsibility? Like, how do you approach that from a from a art, an artistic perspective in the sense that uh, you're you are doing something that isn't just 100% your own? Like, you have your new, new book, Scalagrim, which I, is that, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, Scalagrim. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the Vales of Pagarna. Yeah. yeah. So when you play in somebody else's world like that, when you start, you know, throwing your hands into their sandbox, what? How, how do you approach that differently at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think I was 32 when that first album, we were writing it. I would do it much more reverently than I did then. Hmm. Now, knowing what I know now, um, because I, I didn't I didn't realize at the time anybody would listen to anything that we had done. So, you know, this was just kind of like of, me with my first YouTube videos. I kind of realized maybe, podcasts, yeah. I had no idea. That yeah. that actually um, <laughs> though I don't have any real apologies to make for you know, the Middle Earth album. I just, I think we were well enough along as musicians and producers to make something yeah, pretty cool. Uh, so I'm happy with that one. But yeah, and, and then I've often wanted to go back and deal mm. with that again. Uh, but it's sort of a reverence, uh, I think, as part of it. And then it became a desire to, well, you know, let's tell your own stories. You know, you, yeah. you, you don't need tokens. I, at some point, we had a name for ourselves. Um, and, that, and that was kind of an excuse for me to start doing what I really wanted to do, you know, which was yeah. create my own worlds. Tolkien influenced, certainly. Absolutely. But, yeah, you know, the, back to that program, and this ties in in a way, mm -hmm. you can't you can't write directly in Tolkien's world, I don't think, unless you understand what he thought, mm. what he felt, or what his worldview was. Yeah. Uh, and the things that were important to him and the things he tried to say in that eloquent way that he could say it. And if you don't have that heart uh, for that, then you're just, it's just a mess. I, I don't know why the Amazon people were really attracted to it uh, as, as a story. You know, it just makes no sense to me because either you, you love it and you understand it, or in their case, they didn't think it was good enough. So yeah. that's let's let's make it better you know modern let's make it modern right yeah that's, that's not going to work with tolkien ever it reminds me you know you saying them not understanding uh, tolkien's mind tolkien's right. purposes it's hard yeah it, it, it reminds me of um in the uh the last episode of the rings of power where muriel and ellendil are talking about faith you have to have enough faith and 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 uh, michael has a great in our in our in-depth uh video or an in-depth podcast too uh he mentions like faith in what they haven't established anything and if you're going to sacrifice for, what are you sacrificing for and they yeah. never give you any reason to believe there's anything greater than themselves yeah you uh, you have to you have to build a case for why those characters matter yeah yeah and that's that, those are basic things that you know i learned when i started writing a book oh all these things have to be there uh, yeah. nobody's going to read it and I learned as I went on the first book, but I took it to heart. Um, so, yeah, I just, it was just, it's just baffling. It really is. It really is. It, it, it feels for the money they had, they had an opportunity to hire a lot of really good, smart people who were already really invested into Tolkien's world. And they yeah. just decided not to. Well, also, you know, and I've read different accounts of this. I'm not sure what they have rights to or not. I keep reading that they actually have a, yeah. the rights to the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so, and if that's the case, then they have the rights to the fall of Gondolin, and the, I think that poem, there are bits of the poem in Lord oh. of the Rings, or, mm -hmm. or there's bits about Baron and Luthien, there's bits about... There, uh, yeah, I read know. about that. They actually, so they have the license to the books, but for instance, like Baron and Luthien, that is explicitly disobeyed. Like, you okay. cannot, they're, they're, and I'm not sure if that also applies to... Uh, like the fall of Gondolin and any of the other sort of bits and tales of stories yeah. uh, that might be in uh, yeah. the Lord of the Rings. But, but, um, but they are like, for instance, they're, they are doing now the war of the Rohirrim, which is an anime film based on Helm Hammerhand and, you know, okay. Helm's Deep was created and all that sort of stuff. So they're doing that too. And that's from the appendices to the return of the King. Okay. Correct. So, yeah. 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 Well, so, so you mentioned you're an author now, which yes. surprised me when I heard about that because like I said, yeah, oh, there it is. The, uh, the, the, the Middle Earth album, I still have in rotation 
uh, it's not streaming, but I don't really always do streaming because I like listening to my music, not other people's music. So anyway, but uh, yeah, so it's still in rotation. So you've never been out of mind and we haven't really reconnected after 22 years. So this has been That's fun, true. but but you've changed. I, I've changed, you've changed. And clearly you raised the game because you're now an author with a full like entire world. You didn't just, you know, write a biography you actually created something brand new. You, you, you are a sub creator now, just like Tolkien. So how did you get into that? What inspired you outside of, you know, being, being a reader and a writer and all that sort of stuff, but what, what, how did you get into that? Well, even with progressive rock, it was always a vehicle for me to tell stories. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, when I was 17, six, let's, let's say the years 15 to 17, when everything's, you know, you're very impressionable. Well, that's the time I found Tolkien. That's also the time I found Rush, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. and, uh, and some of those bands. And so it just all got in there together for me, uh, like, a, you know, the, being a Viking scald, you know, or something like that. It was any, any, any song I wrote, it was almost impossible to not try to tell a story. Hmm. And after 20 some odd albums, it's it, you realize, well, it might be easier to tell a story if you just tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to put it into four minute or five yeah. minute fragments. Yeah, yeah. So way back in 2005, we did an album called The Inconsolable Secret, which was a big deal for us. Uh, double album, very complicated stuff. And in it, uh, which in, Inconsolable Secret is a, is a cool phrase uh, grabbed from a C.S. Lewis quote which is worth looking up. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, so I, I began to weave my own mythology around uh, a character named Lirazel, which I did borrow from uh, Lord Dunsany. <laughs> Bar borrowed the name. And uh, that was from, uh, was it, uh, the King of Elfland's daughter, I think. Anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, little bits and pieces uh, I borrowed, but began to create this myth that just consumed me. Hmm. Uh, for years, I, I came out with a book of poetry uh, in an attempt to do something a little like the Lays of Beleriand. Uh, so I ended up doing a 20,000 word wow. rhyming. rhyming. <laughs> Setting the bar very low, yeah. I see, from the beginning. Yeah, yeah from the beginning. <laughs> uh, and then that, it, that just it haunted me ever since. I set out oh. to write a book about the character in uh, you know a few years later, but uh, we just had our... Uh, our one and only son and so we were busy raising him and so I just kept putting off the writing hmm. until uh, the pandemic and it had just been boiling in my head about the time they locked us down it just all sort of to coalesce for me hey this is your opportunity take those six weeks and write a book well seven months later you know, <laughs> the six weeks there's a book but the character it, instead of trying to tell an epic fantasy like Tolkien uh I told a story about a loner uh, who's in a lot of trouble, and then I put him in a world that would be something like, that would come out of the mind, of, and here's more comparisons, but something maybe from the mind of Lovecraft or Clark Ashton Smith, just a terrifying, cursed realm. And you put this loner character uh, who has no memory of himself, uh, he just sort of comes to in the middle of a fight for his life, and he sees this beautiful girl uh, that he knows he loves her, but he can't put his finger on who she is. And she's being kidnapped in front of him. And it's just a terrible, terrible thing. And if you can sort of picture all that, that's page one. Of the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's a more, it's like a sword and sorcery character dropped into a, a Lovecraftian dream world, but with the worldview of, of Tolkien. Mm. That makes sense kind of indicate whether you might like it or not yeah um, yeah so mm. you know it's it's set up as if it's to be an action novel like a conan or an elf book but really the further you go and i know you've read it, the further you go they'll start to be these sort of uh episodes in this character scalagrim's life where he sort of touches more on sort of that magical tolkien-esque uh, what the word for it would be it, was, it just he sort of crosses into that world and back and it's, it becomes the writing becomes more prose uh than just you know yeah violent action sort of thing. <laughs> and that, <laughs> well, that's the whole intention is to take that sword and sorcery kind of story and, and let it transcend into something uh, bigger and meaningful not just a plot you know yeah and i uh, i haven't read all of it i read the first uh like four three or four chapters i think it's four yeah um 
But what I like about it is knowing now, one, that this isn't something you just sat down to write, right? There was, like, like Tolkien and like a lot of other very successful authors, you've, you created something before that. And this is yeah. sort of like you spent that time building something Years. more than just, yeah, than just yeah. words on paper. Like there's, there's an entire history you've created. You, you wrote an entire like Lay of Lathian type of uh, Lay of Lirazel or what, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's what you call it, but you, you did all this and now you have a book. And, you know, in, in reading your book um, so far, one thing that struck me, and I can't, I can't help it, but I have to compare it to the Rings of Power. Oh, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. So go right ahead. Which is the Rings of Power suffered from a problem is that everything, everything that happens is told to you. So you're told that um, uh, Elrond and Durin are great friends. You never see them you're doing anything shown, yeah. together, yeah, yeah, other than digging around for Mithril, but you're, you're told that. You're told that Elrond and Galadriel are great fellows. You're told that Elrond, that Galadriel is a, uh, uh, a commander of the Northern Armies, and if the army is like seven people, that's as big as... Right. So, what it looks like, yeah. Uh, you're told that the Harfoots have to, have to uh, migrate. Why? We don't know. They're just, you're just... So everything is telling it. And so they don't show you anything in the yeah. whole movie until the very last episode and until people yeah. survive like a giant volcano right in, in your book it does uh, uh, maybe the best way to the best analogy is it, it does what star wars is which it drops you right in the middle of a battle right, right in the middle of something happening and you're allowed to actually experience the character before you're told who the character is just by saying you know he was a great warrior or not not in this book he is or he was a great warrior who could wield a sword well right it, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. do that it drops you right yeah. into the story and i no, and i he does, yeah that. he doesn't know who he is uh and he just has to, to survive yeah uh, so he's finding out about himself as he goes at the same time you're finding out and and you do have i mean there are certain info dumps that occur within the story to build the world mm -hmm. uh, but you can do that and i'm being very careful in the second book now to try to, I got to get a certain amount of information out, but I want to, it's necessary so that when something really happens, you have a little bit of background and Tolkien, you know, he dove in with that. And what is it? Chapter two of the shadows of the past. Yeah. Yeah. Massive info dumps. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's and with him, you know, it's, it worked perfectly and yeah. it, readers are patient and understand the whole book. Isn't going to be that. Uh, like we've just yeah. witnessed the rings of power. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's important to put the put the reader into that world and don't right jar him out of it or her out of it for anything. You know, keep them immersed. Yeah. So yeah, important. Yeah. So how many books do you have planned then in this series? And and you have uh, to promise us one thing: you can't you can't pull a George R. R. Martin, wherefore, you know, he gets a TV contract and then he I doesn't he doesn't publish anything for like a decade. Yeah, no, oh. no. Um, I'm about, I'd say, forty thousand words into the next uh, wow. book, and at first oh, I yeah. thought this will be a, you know, I think at first I thought this will be some short stories, uh, but then I realized no, I, I've got something going here, and I expanded it. And I do believe ultimately it will be a quartet or a quintet. Mm -hmm. uh, it has an ending. I know what the ending is. Uh, good. So that's good. That's told, also not like J.J. Yeah. Abrams and the Rings of Powers. They don't know where it's going. Know. They just throw out mystery yeah. boxes and yeah, good. No, I, I know what. It, and ultimately, it's about um, you know, it's not allegorical. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but yeah. it's not yeah. allegorical. But to me, I'm you know that law girl that's kidnapped. That he's, he will spend the rest of he'll spend the millennia searching for her. Uh, she represents joy to me. Mm. So mm. I, I view him as a person who has lost everything and lost his joy. And really, uh, that's what he's searching for. So if you kind of keep all those things in mind as you're writing, uh, it'll keep you on the path to the end. I, I know how it's going to end uh, because I know how all, all stories end. Yeah, yeah so, that's right. I mean, I told the, you. The, good, yeah. the good ones, yeah. It, it yeah. ends with, with what is it, sorrow. Uh, that pierces like I can't remember the phrase, oh. or, or joy that pierces like uh, sorrow or something. Yeah, it's just yeah. it has to be poignant. Poignant, yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah. just it's, hack and slash. It's just, there's a good there's a good deal of that. So, um, well, it's like you know, you can have the best, most beautiful action. You can write the best story, but if you don't care about the people in the story, which again to. 
to beat the continual dead horse is that is that what happens in the rings of power you don't care about the characters in the end because yeah. they haven't done anything that you care about right. there's they, they aren't the kinds of people and so if you create a world where they where you can care about it that's what tolkien did and i know that's what you're trying to do and i haven't finished reading it but i i will read the whole the whole first book I but it, it's it's uh you're so invested in it that when boromir dies you can't help but stop Right. Like for me, I almost cried when I was in seventh or eighth grade. I think it was seventh grade when I read it. And I could like I was like, I'm a man. I can't cry about this character. But I was so invested in it because you cared about him. Yeah. And uh, and that's because uh, the end is coming. We know where the end is going to be. But and these people are going to miss out on that. Yeah. And those scenes, you know, some of those famous scenes, you know, they take place in a couple of pages. But in your mind, you know, it's it's huge. And yeah. that's an art. Uh, obviously, when a writer can make things so memorable, it's like you saw it. Yeah. Uh, the character meant a lot, so you're never going to forget what Boromir did there at the end. Yeah, uh, and just I don't know, beautifully written. That that book was a miracle. It was Lord of the Rings is an absolute miracle. Yeah, and and to, when people compare him to somebody like Terry Brooks, I'm not sure how much familiar you are with it. I, I know, yeah. <laughs> Who, um. I mean, really, Tolkien published four fiction books in his entire life. Two, yeah. if you count The Lord of the Rings as one book, not three. Right. Um, and so his entire life experience, the philology, uh, his research into other mythologies, right, it all lent itself in creating this amazing world that is, is, is the equivalent of an entire civilization, right? Like, you don't have anybody else who created an entire world from, <laughs> from the word go, from Iluvatar, to... The very end. Well, he didn't finish it, but we, he knew he knew where the end was going to go too. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so you're writing the book, and you're a musician. Yes. Which one is harder? <laughs> Being a musician. Oh, what? Um, really? It, absolutely. Oh. Uh, because I mean, I think I've sort of trained for this next part of my life, the whole time, uh, and because I've read a thousand books, and I don't just read fantasy. In fact, I've read very little of it, if any. Uh, uh, huh. I don't. I, I, uh, I did when I was in my 20s, and of course I revisit Tolkien often, yeah, but yeah. none of the rest of it really. Um, That's so probably a good thing because most is, of the rest yeah. of it isn't exactly top yeah. shelf stuff. Yeah, and it's impossible to be original, but you can take from other genres and kind of mix those influences up. I, be I became a fan of books like uh, the Bernard Cornwell, uh, Richard Sharp books, hmm. which is like historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Setting in the Napoleonic Wars, and huh. so I just read a fifty million of these like hornblower books, and mm -hmm. and you can take that same kind of action and put it in a fantastical world, and not have to uh, have all that accuracy and all that research, which yeah. I, it was way more than I wanted to do with Tolstoy. <laughs> so, but yeah, I don't know where were we going with this. Well, well, I was asking about music oh. and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and well, writing as with music. You know, I've spent my life as a producer or in the studio run the business with my wife julie and uh, songwriting partner uh, fred schindler uh, but when it comes time to to be a band and to to go do shows and, and that sort of thing or even just uh like trying to get everybody lined up to to come in and record their parts you know mm -hmm. after uh 30 years <laughs> You know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, just show up. <laughs> just, <laughs> Be on sit, Yeah. Learn the song, you know. <laughs> this is not hard. And um, and don't get me wrong, I've been is surrounded it? by beautiful, wonderful, talent, super talented musicians, and they're everybody's just trying to live their life, and I'm trying to drag them into this vision I have. So it's probably frustrating yeah. for everybody. But well, uh, it's, you know, it's like you, any group project. Yeah. Always, it is. Um, you, yeah, yeah, you understand that. Yeah. So, um, but to to just sit down by yourself with your with your imagination and, and begin to work out the puzzle of how a sentence should be constructed to convey, <laughs> you know, that's just fun to me. That's just oh, that's fun. And that's they good. say, you know, as you get older, you're supposed to do things like that, like work crossword puzzles and things like that to keep sharp so so instead of a crossword puzzle you're writing an entire world in a I am, new, yeah. three, four new novels here. yeah exactly yeah. taking the yeah. easy way out god really and that's that's the plan yeah. Yeah. but but so but then you have another like the reason i asked the, the writing versus music is that you still had an album just come out yeah um yeah. and and that stalled you know the writing process of the book quite a bit so you know you're fighting that i you know, you, you think you can do it all, and I'm trying to do it all at the same time. It's yeah. it's, it's difficult because I want to 
peel off two hours every day at least uh, to write, to work on the book. But you know, in the middle of an album production, we're out there in our the studio working hours a day. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to make something really, really big that's going to immediately impress a lot of people. As an author, you know, I'm just starting out, so it's not like I have a track record. I have yeah. to. Uh, answer to this is this is yeah. an audience that's dedicated and, and you know you it's you can't be objective really so it's just a struggle i guess to to get these things done you know plus the logistics of doing it uh, I, I, we run the whole thing ourselves here publishing yeah is the is the album right it 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 is directly related to yes yeah yeah, so my idea, I'm a, I've got the three of them. There's a trilogy. So I thought okay. this would be neat. Now, I'm not the, Glasshammer's not the first to do some big thing that spanned many albums, but, uh, you know, so back in the pandemic days, in the lockdown, uh, this album came out, Dreaming City. And that one, yeah. Uh, and we announced it was going to be a trilogy, which is kind of a trick in a way, because it doesn't exist. It's just in your head. But when you tell everybody publicly this is what we're doing, then you sort of have this obligation to follow through on it. I knew, <laughs> I, I knew it would keep us going and keep the band alive for three years to do that. So it was it served many purposes. But mm -hmm. I wanted to tell the story of this loner, Scalagram, and I wanted it to s s sort of start it off kind of like an homage to the Elric of Mel Nibidae books. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It started that way. And then I began to think about the character a little bit more. Uh, and, and then part of it was, was a gimmick. And I'll try to explain really quick. Um, hmm. I wanted that album, when you open the album, I wanted it to look as if a band maybe from the 70s had come across some weird, you know, obscure Conan book or something like that. And, and they did it in their, you know, bombastic prog rock way made this elaborate concept out. I wanted it to look like that. So there's sketch yeah, art in it. There's yeah. all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then, so I, I put in there that it came from a, a book called The Scalagram Chronicles. Well, immediately people started looking it up, trying to find the book. And like, oh, my gosh. oh, no, what did you do? Well, that was it for me. I'm like, perfect. You know, I mean, if they're already that pulled into it and the character has resonated with them yeah. through music, uh, then hey, that was a great marketing plan. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> it, 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 it all came together pretty fast. I just I'm, I kept getting emails about you know the character, and I'm like, I'm going to do this. You know? So yeah, they're related. I did let in so much as I had to end the albums, uh, and we just wrapped it up with an album called At the Gate. I knew that my characters, the end of the story would come, so I let I let the scalagram of my albums go off kind of in a slightly different direction. Hmm than the one in my books so they both both can be enjoyed independently of one another it's it's impossible to tell the story musically not all yeah. of it so no no uh, you know there's no spoilers in the albums yeah really at all. it's just a, essentially a you know kind of a inspired by mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. book that that didn't exist at the time but of course now it does yeah well i think like i said earlier i'm, I'm not i'm not the biggest prog rock fan in the world that's but okay I, I, but 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 I think like there's a lot to like in this, even for someone like me who's and, and it's just because I really haven't taken the time to listen to it. And so for the last for the last few days, I've listened to this album a bunch of times. Uh, and I, I love uh, one. I mean, clearly, you guys are amazing musicians. Thank you. We've been doing it for a long time. Very uh, nice. I play piano and just a very tiny bit of guitar. But yeah. um, but I think Fred, he does the he does most of the keyboard work, right? You're the bassist. Well, I'm yeah, on this album, I think both of us did keyboards. Oh, okay. So, you know, so I play keyboards and bass, and he's been doing more guitar lately than than normal. Okay. Uh, so we switch back and forth, but I, I play bass on all the albums. Wow. Making making even like yeah 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 that's a lot of talent. I can't I, like I'm, and, and then, I'm, I'm okay at one, but don't give me don't don't do that. Well, and and a lot of other people, you know, come in to help us make these things. Yeah. Uh, really rock, and uh, we've got a great drummer, Aaron Ralston. Uh, Hannah Pryor has been our singer for the last couple of albums. Uh, we've, uh, there's a guest appearance by the current lead singer for the band, Yes, who used to be our singer. Wow. Uh, yeah. So he did, I don't know, three or four albums with us back in the early 2010s. And 
uh, and then went on to join Yes. And then he came back and did a song with us. We're still good friends. So uh, lots of really talented people that get together to do these things. So. Man, um, I like I. It's hard enough to pull like a couple people together to do a podcast. I can't imagine how much it takes to put a whole album together. Like it's that. it's it's not. I mean, it's. I'm very blessed, <laughs> you know. So I would only, you know, mention complaints just because they're kind of funny sometimes. <laughs> just trying to uh, keep people on schedule. Hey, man, because, it's, it's, a struggle produces a better outcome in the end, right? Absolutely. If, if, you, absolutely. if, you, if everything comes easily, then you're never challenged to do anything better. Yeah. So, but, but like with not being a prog rock fan, I, you know, my experience with progressive rock or the, that handful of albums that actually came a little bit before my time, but some people handed me albums when I was a teenager uh, and I got into bands like Rush and mm -hmm. Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Yes, and albums that had been out for a few years already. So those kind of hit me at 17 and hmm. stuck with me as some of my favorite albums. But since then, and since Glass Hammer and a few other bands kicked off this revival in the 90s, there's hundreds and hundreds of releases every year. Now. Uh, and I don't, I'm not a fan really of that sort of thing. I, my wife and I, we, we walk around the house listening to, you know, 80s stuff and, new, and brand new stuff and all kinds of music. And um, although, she is a fan of Genesis, you know, so, uh, but we don't, okay. yeah, we're not prog rock, um, well, if, aficionados, if you, in, except for the fact that we've pretty much devoted our lives <laughs> to, to making it, not really listening to it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you only listen to one thing too, I mean, how, how, how much more can you do? Like you said, like my favorite song on the album is the third song North by North, what yeah, North of North, yeah, North of North. Right. And like you mentioned to me that it's the first, it's one of the, first times that you've incorporated more uh i guess electronic and oh more... no 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 uh, okay. we've been dabbling with that since yeah. uh, maybe a four albums back we okay. sort of stick one in there uh, and and we've had it in mind to do a whole album uh of electronic oh yeah music. again it's, it's, it's nostalgic with us we, it, we would do it because it's it's something we grew up listening to like uh i mentioned you know john carpenter doing his mm -hmm. scores in the 80s and just those kind of interesting soundtracks. And they're, they're fun, like the Stranger Things theme song, for instance. Absolutely, yeah. Everybody likes that. It's fun to make music like that. Yeah. But it's easier to make music like that because there's no melody, really. There's no <laughs> there's no lyrics to write. Uh, it just has to be mood. It's all about mood. Yeah. You know what's funny is is um, my son, who's 12 now, he watched Tron Legacy and loved that yeah. movie, and he yeah. loves the soundtrack to that yeah. movie. It's Daft yeah. Punk. And when I first started, when I first heard the song, I was it, that was the first thing that popped in my head was it had that, especially the first couple minutes of it, it had that sort of that, yeah. I don't know, that feeling that if you'd listen to the Tron Legacy soundtrack, you'll, you'll get an idea for it. I, yeah. I just, yeah, I, man, if you put out a whole album that, that's, that has that, I, I love that sort of stuff. We're because you know what, that. when I'm working during the day, I can't listen to lyrics or else my mind goes into what people are singing and I can't get my work done. We are talking very seriously about doing it. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, so... So where can people get all this, right? We looked at, you have your website, but what's the best way in, in order to get your albums, your book? Uh, easiest way for the book, obviously, is Amazon. Uh, so you're looking for uh, Stephen R. Bad, mm -hmm. the PH. Uh, the title or the name of the book is Scaligram in the Vales of Pagarna. Uh, okay. It's available there. It's a uh, Kindle, hardcover, trade paperback. Or whatever is the easiest. Uh, you can buy one from my website, glasshammer.com, and I'll autograph it for you. Oh, nice. Uh, if you want. Uh, the albums, we always encourage people to get from albums from us directly from the website. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just obvious for obvious reasons. Where we also sell high res downloads for, you know, headphone guys like myself, mm -hmm. uh, like the audio file quality recordings. So that's all there. And then I think every album's on iTunes. Uh, at least on iTunes, if not spread out over other yeah. platforms. But I don't stream a lot. Uh, I'm just one of those guys that's going to hold out for that. We, we think sometimes, well, would it help? Um, not really interested in, in that kind of help, really. Uh, yeah. I'd, ra I'd rather have a smaller, more dedicated audience um, than you know just get the casual listener uh, because it costs, it costs us a tremendous amount of money to do all this so uh, it has yeah. to pay for itself so yeah i've heard some yeah. some from from some just musicians who just start out who just like you know they're it's so hard to get a foothold when 
your streaming is your only income. It's well, absolutely. And they're up against, you know, unless they own an actual studio uh, and, and I do, uh, and it's still it's tremendously expensive, you know, to get yeah. all of that done. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge every time, but uh, you know, I think fortunately for glass hammer, we sort of got out there and made a name for ourselves a long time ago. And right when the internet exploded, we were right there. And right. It, it didn't hurt at all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the great thing about the world we live in now. Like you're not, you're not beholden to some sort of greater media company that has their own message. You know? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, that, that it's has we, to be told. We were offered, uh, you know, record deals off and on through the years. And I think I became notorious for turning them down. And, <laughs> and at some point they quit asking and I wasn't going to tour anymore. Uh, I didn't want to do that. We, like to just play a few shows every mm -hmm. now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So wasn't going to play ball uh, in a way that was going to make yeah. us, you know, some darling of a record company yeah. that, that could have made us probably a bigger name. But uh, I much preferred being on the front line of the whole thing, you know, just yeah. kind of knowing what's happening. Right. And and it, I love that we now live in a world where that's a lot easier. Right? You're allowed to publish your own book now, right? You didn't need yeah. to go out and submit a manuscript and get a deal. You can create your own music in your own room with a couple of friends and make it sound pretty good, pretty dang good these days. And, oh, yeah. and, and to do that in an environment where one, you can be inspired by the things that actually inspired you, not by, uh, the, the machine on top of you, oh, yeah. uh, is, uh, is a great thing. And so it's exciting for me to see that, you know, you're still changing with the ways that the winds are like the, at least the digital capabilities of the world are going like that. You can, you can download all your stuff. You can view all your stuff yeah. you're online and you know, you can follow you on Twitter. And, uh, but, but it's kind of like, like what we, we hear, what we're trying to do with the one ring. We're not trying to create a huge media, like, like yeah. we don't want to comment on everything. We don't want to be these people who are just out there berating the rings of power. And then we're going to berate the war of the ring, the war of the And then we're going to talk about how we don't like uh, willow and all this other stuff. We, we might do more, but it gets really tough. And so, but to have a small group of dedicated people that enjoy what you do is so much more gratifying than a yeah. large amount of people where 20% of them are, um, tweeting you threats and, and not, not that anybody has, nobody's, nobody's tweeting anything, but, yeah. but tweet, like saying, things that you just don't want to see in life like that bring you down a little bit right yeah i mean we get to hear from fans or i do more than anybody i guess since i have all the social media accounts <laughs> but, uh, you know i hear from them almost daily and you know they'll have the odd suggestion now and then and you're just kind of scratching your head but mostly it's you know there's people that it's it, that what we do has affected in a very positive way and people that, that have come to depend on it I'm like, oh my gosh you know it's just incredible to hear those kinds of things. So we don't have the applause from an audience every night, but you know, so you get to, you know, and, and I don't know, I think authors do this more than probably musicians, but I love to answer everybody you know, that, that emails and try to say a few kind words and let them yeah. know, you know, because they, they look up, they look up to us in a strange way. So yeah, yeah. it's, it's important. And I'd rather collect uh, loyal fans, yeah. um, you know, it's a band like us. When we started, we knew that, you know, this isn't going to be the next big thing. You know, what we're, the genre we're kind of approaching is something that's, it's been done. It had its heyday. Uh, it, it, they, those bands in the 70s sold gazillions of albums, and it's not going to happen again. And that's not what we're after, really. Yeah. So we, we just get to make the music we want to make about anything we want to make it. Yeah, and if we want to do an electronic music album, we can go. We can do that. Right. If I want to go to Middle Earth again, we'll, we'll do that. You know? Right, and it's authentic. It's um, it's your even if we don't like it, it's it's authentically what you wanted to create then. Whereas, bringing it back to what we saw with Things of Power, it's not authentic. It's been it's it's a corporate exercise, is what it feels like, right? And and when you get such personal involvement, I, I had a video that came out. Um, I don't know, a month and a half ago, where I, where I talked about the one thing missing with the Rings of Power is somebody with a lot of passion. Because yeah. there is nobody there that's driving it forward to a vision that, that they had. You can say that J.D. Payne, Patrick McKay are that, but clearly uh, they were 
handpicked by Amazon to do it. Amazon already wanted to do it. Whereas something like um, it, Peter Jackson's films, he was working on this. He created animatics. He was promoting this and saying, we need to do at least two films. And people were telling him, no, we got to do one film. No, you got to kill off the hobbits, right? But no, but his passion, his desire to go and do it, it was, it was that that was there that was able to overcome uh, the push of the media company on top of him. And that's, the, and, and when he, either you have the power to do that and not many people do. He cared about the source material too. Yeah, and well, that yeah. too. Yeah, um, and uh, but he brought his passion for that source material with him, and these these guys don't have it. But when someone like you is creating something from the start, and you have that passion, uh, I think it, I think it shows through. You know, like, thank you, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, I, nice. I hope it does. It was, it was really nice talking with you again. Hopefully, we can we can do some more. Maybe talk some more distinct Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth. Silver yeah, we'd Rings love to. Absolutely. Point. Yeah. At some point. So. Absolutely. Uh, again, if you want to follow uh, Glasshammer, they have uh, Glasshammer Prague on uh, Twitter. Right there. Uh, that's right. That's the official account. Yeah. There's a Facebook page for Glasshammer as well. Easy to find. In fact, if you go to glasshammer.com, right at the top of the page, there's links for all of our social media accounts. It's very okay. easy to find. Great. Yep. Um, right up there. YouTube, yep. Twitter, Facebook, and then you also have a forum. Uh, yep. All right. Well, good good chatting with you and you too, uh, everybody else yeah go to glasshammer.com and uh we'll see you next time and thanks for joining me on this little bit of a detour outside of just tolkien and lord of the rings which maybe we'll see more of because it's a lot of fun to talk with people who are uh, more talented than me so <laughs> they say surround yourself with good people and they do, they do. This is good so thank you man all right good seeing you steve take all care right, you thanks too. everybody all right well i couldn't go through an entire episode without actually giving you a song by glass hammer so here is the first song off their latest album at the gate the song is called the years roll by and uh, i hope you like it i i've actually grown to really enjoy the album it's usually not my style but um you know the more you listen to something and you get to know somebody and the integrity they have with their music it, it tends to uh, give you more appreciation for the quality that's there. So I hope you like it. Uh, check the links below for downloading the album. And if you're a patron, you'll get the uh, two songs from the Middle Earth album, which was released in 2002. You can go to thewondering.com slash patron, or you might as well just buy the album. Just go to glasshammer.com. So I hope you enjoy the song and uh, let us know what you think. <laughs>